Earlier this month, the Reserve Bank of India launched a pilot version of the e-rupee in four cities. But what will it take for it to become a widespread means of payment? I'm Varsha Meghani and you're watching Nuts and Boats by Forbes India. The e-rupee is nothing but a digital form of the Indian rupee. Because it's issued by the RBI, it's called a Central Bank Digital Currency, or CBDC. To transact in e-rupees, those who are part of the ongoing pilot first need to download the e-rupee app from the Google Play Store. They then need to verify their details and open an e-wallet on their smartphones. This e-wallet then needs to be connected to their bank account via the app. Money from that account can then be transferred to the e-wallet. And that's it. They're now ready to transfer e-rupees to other people and merchants who also have the app. But wait a minute, you're probably thinking, I already make cashless payments using Google Pay, Phone Pay, Paytm, apps that use the UPI infrastructure to facilitate payments between parties in a fast and cost-efficient manner. So how are CBDCs different? UPI transfers are essentially account-based debits and credits that happen between commercial banks. Let's say you buy a box of strawberries from a fruit vendor. You open up your Google Pay app, scan the vendor's QR code, and punch in the amount you owe him. It appears simple, but behind the scenes, an elaborate clearing and settlement process is triggered by your bank and the fruit seller's bank to ensure the right amount is paid. CBDCs, on the other hand, do away with intermediaries. So just like you would pull out 200 rupees from your purse to pay the fruit seller if you were using cash, a CBDC is a digital version of that cash and even comes in the same denominations as banknotes and coins. You can simply transfer 200 e-rupees from your e-wallet to the fruit seller's e-wallet without your respective banks getting involved. Without this intermediation, the transaction won't leave an audit trail, just like it doesn't with physical cash. Well, in theory, yes. But how that will work out practically is still unclear. The e-rupee is, after all, built on a private blockchain, which can be accessed by the RBI or whoever it grants access to. The blockchain, as we know, makes every transaction traceable. In China, for example, where the digital yuan is being trialed, critics argue that it is less about money and more about data. By tracking the everyday transactions of users, the potential for state surveillance only increases. In response to privacy concerns, T. Ravi Shankar, the deputy governor of the RBI, recently clarified that the central bank is working on ways to keep e-rupee transactions anonymous. He said that the RBI wants to achieve this through technological and legal solutions. But here's the thing, CBDCs can also be programmable, which means they can be programmed to be used in specific ways or specific purposes. China, for example, programmed its digital yuan to expire after a certain period of time to encourage users to spend money quickly in a bid to kickstart the economy. Similarly, in India, e-rupees given to farmers, for example, could potentially be programmed such that they can only be used to buy fertilizers. While this is a big use case for CBDCs, it does give the authorities greater insight into the identity of every user. problem. At the moment, there isn't a solid incentive for people to switch from UPI to the e-rupee. UPI is already widely used as a mode of digital payment. It involves near zero costs and apps like Google Pay and Phone Pay that run on UPI are already on our phones. So why bother downloading something new? Second, CBDCs have to contend with cash. India is still a largely cash-based economy. Cash usage is 70% higher than it was in November 2016, before demonetization. The anonymity and privacy that cash offers is unmatched. That's why people continue to use cash, despite the ubiquity of UPI. China issued free digital yuan to people via lottery system to encourage them to use it. In Nigeria, ATM cash withdrawals were recently capped at $45 per day, down from the previous limit of $335 per day, in order to push the e-Naira. 
The central bank is also looking at new ways to boost interest, like offering discounts to drivers and passengers to three-wheeler taxis who use the e-Naira. According to Sunil Rangala, an economist and senior vice president at World Line India, quote, for any kind of payment ecosystem to be a success, the largest thing is acceptance, and that comes from trust and security. In India, thanks to UPI, users already have the muscle memory of paying for transactions online. The base conditions are in place. It's now a matter of building trust, educating users, and incentivizing merchants to use this as a means of payment, end quote. Trust for a user comes not only from knowing that her money is safe and secure, but also that her data is safe and secure.